So for this panel, we have uh, David Martin, who represents the Resistencia project from Spain. Ignacio, that was also present at the previous panel. Jose Gomez Marquez, who is our special guest. And as I said, as I will make the proper introductions. Marcos Mendez, that has, was the last presenter in the last session on the panel on ventilators and the representatives for the RIA MIMA project. Um, so we're good to go. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to try to just uh, share my screen, I think. Just give me a second. Oh my gosh. One second, please. I don't know why I'm, I'm seeing all the time the wrong uh, video. Just so I have done this a few times today. I'm going to share this um, brief, brief introduction to know about I don't know if you can uh, confirm that you haven't seen my screen, but I don't know why I'm sharing the other screen all the time. Anyway, I will try to go back. So uh, my name is Cesar. I'm going to do a brief introduction on uh, things we have been working on for the last uh, days or weeks in Spain. I have been uh, working with a, with a group of people here trying to uh, document and share information about uh, COVID-19. And I'm going to start. If you can confirm that you can just check this presentation, someone in the chat maybe. Now uh, we see your screen, Tessa. It's going. OK. So thank you, David. So, uh, so far, three weeks ago, we started uh, just uh, launching this kind of platform, the forum, uh, with uh, Coronavirus Maker, that is a community, but it's also kind of a forum. So far, the, the forum uh, has reached in uh, two weeks, like 3,000 people sharing information, sharing knowledge. And one of the biggest challenges we had was the, the problem on certification, legal aspects, implications, so I, I like to do kind of a, to start with a, a very brief introduction about the, how is it going in Spain? Because there have been a lot of questions, there have been a lot of activity. So I think that uh, offering this can be a bit helpful for people that are outside Spain, but also will help us to kind of frame the, some of the issues regarding the legal aspects. So just to give you a, a, a overview, uh, in this in this uh, forum, what we try to do is to create knowledge with all the people that has the expertise on what can be useful and needed in times of this crisis. So, for example, one of the the first articles that was proposed in the forum was this kind of specification for a respirator uh, useful for the for this crisis. And this was written by a doctor called Pancho Cañizo from Gregorio Marañón Hospital after consulting with several people because uh, three, three weeks ago, we had no clue about, okay, what are the actual interesting parts? So what we try to do here is to gather all this knowledge and share it with other people so we can indeed uh, create a useful respirator or useful solutions. So we have already talked about resistance team. We also had one of the members here. So uh, yeah, this is kind of one of the first projects that was uh, covered and was launched in this uh, community. And the, one of the interesting things in this uh, whole um, community is that so far people have been creating um, industrial version and maker versions of several prototypes. One of the uh, most important parts of the process, and I was talking with Jose a few <laughs> minutes ago, is that we had the chance to have people uh, working from totally different areas. For example, uh, this is a project called Sirio, and this project was uh, started by someone doing 3D printing here in Madrid and a company creating medical devices in Murcia. So this kind of collaboration has been possible in the last uh, days. Other parts, maybe Miguel Angel would like to talk uh, about, there are a lot of solutions being covered in the, in the forum that usually, if we think about the legal or the regulatory 
uh, would have a hard time passing by maybe <laughs> at this uh, right now like for example this kind of alternatives for lost core resources Miguel Angel has been creating a lot of good content on for example how to filter the output of respirators if you don't have filters the the output of the ventilator could be filled with viruses in in aerosol uh, uh, solutions so they could be dangerous so there are solutions like passing by the the air through a column of water and after doing some research uh, it seems like after one meter uh, it eliminates most of the viruses so the forum we think it's a place where we can gather knowledge and also propose new new solutions uh, so far the topics have been like respirator but also face mask filter a mask, a data science, a lot of different topics have been covered so far. Uh, most of this work has been done by volunteers and organizing telegram groups. Uh, so far there are like 100 national groups, 20 international groups that are trying to replicate and collaborating in this topic. It's mostly Spanish speaking people, but do we have groups from Germany, from UK and other places. And, and we have this, um, thematic groups where they talk about filtering systems and stuff. Um, one of the biggest challenges so far has been uh, producing useful stuff. And um, I'd say the biggest success so far has been creating this kind of face shields that would uh, prevent uh, people that are exposed to the virus when uh, someone coughs or someone kind of um, spits on you because of this or sneezes, it could transmit you the virus. So uh, there have been several designs of these uh, pieces that is kind of a face protection. And one of the most interesting aspects, there are 16,000 people. And so far in Spain, they have been producing around 40,000 masks per day, producing and and delivering. So I think it's, 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 it's it by itself, really interesting. They are serving this to the hospitals. They are serving this to people in need. And one of the, on, on one hand, this has inspired traditional industry because right now there are people that have been just uh, going and creating their own versions, uh, doing injection molding, but there have been some, some challenges. Uh, some of the challenges are, for example, in Spain, we are divided into several regions or states, however you want to call it, it could be equivalent to the states in the United States or the different regions or municipalities. And each one had a different requirement for the very same face mask. So we had like, even with the same design, they went to an hospital and they say, no, no, this hospital will not allow this because this doesn't comply to these rules. And then in another uh, area of the country, they would have like, yeah, this is okay, this is perfect. So it, it's very, <laughs> this has been quite complex. Also, there is this problem with logistics. We have no logistics and we expect as quarantine goes on to that people will start like having issues on delivering the actual uh, devices and products. Uh, so the, for us, it's not like trying to replace traditional industries or traditional product, but just create something that works as a temporary uh, solution. Regarding respirators, we had, uh, I, I'm doing a census of respirators in Spain and uh, there are like 37 respirator projects. I have it in total covered like 56. Uh, so 37 are just from Spain. And last week we had a call uh, with the Spanish Agency of uh, Medicines. Uh, and this was an open call for anyone working on, on, on any of these projects. There were like 113 people uh, launching the questions live, like talking with the actual technicians in charge of certification process and validation of these devices. It was kind of, a, kind of a, it was also a Zoom conference like this one we are doing right now. Um, one of the um, biggest, this has been even in the press today in, in Spain. And I'd say it like out of the 37 uh, prototypes, not all the prototypes are, are ready for action, I mean, 
there are some steps you need to cover. There are some steps you need to do. There are some uh, trials. And uh, so far, from six to eight different uh, projects have completed this, these steps. So it was um, this this processes uh, or this project are moving forward. These are going to just uh, be able to to advance further, and they are checking on on how to scale, but not just on the manufacturing side, but also on how to scale on the on the other side. On how do we do we cover our legal aspects? How do we make sure that this is going to work? Uh, uh, and and I think this is an kind of the open conversation that we are uh, having at this moment. Like, how do we, for example, Miguel Angel is going to talk about this whole conversation on 3D printed mask and why is it a good idea or a bad idea or how does, how do you certify things like this for, if, if we focus on respirators, uh, so far, I'd like to share with you this document that has been released just to give you an overview of how, how do they plan to do it, at least in Spain. Uh, I think that this cannot be translated to other places like this. I know the FDA has just released also uh, some information about how to do this. This is 17th of March from the Spanish. Uh, this is just in Spanish, but I will do like kind of live translation. Basically, they, they ask the project, okay, if you want this to be delivered in the hospitals, uh, we first need to know why are, what, what do you plan to use this for? How this is useful? Uh, please just write down, like, what are you trying to achieve? Who is going to be uh, your final user? Is it someone affected by COVID? Is it someone that has meal symptoms? Um, and they're like trying to, say, to assess the risk how are you trying to uh, make sure that this doesn't break down and kills the people connected to the respirator? And how do you plan to, to set up an access? I, I'd like to clarify also that uh, in, the, in the very same meeting, there was a conversation about the, the standards because you know here there are these norms, technical norms like UNE, EN, ISO, whatever, uh, six. These are the actual uh, norm for the respirators. But one of the challenges is that some of the devices that have been showcased so far or that have been created uh, are not that complex, are more like mechanical, uh, uh, mechanical elements pressing the ambu or other elements. So they were like trying to propose like a some kind of uh, lower requirement solution for this kind of project. So basically what they are asking the, the every respirator is, okay, first you go with the prototype, you write down what are your requirements, you prepare your paper, you are like, you say, okay, I, I think this device can support a person for 24 hours under mechanical ventilation. And then you need to do some trials with humans uh, with, with human simulators, I mean, sorry, uh, or lung simulators. And then you need to validate the results with uh, animals, in this case, with porks. So after you get all of this, you need to supply this to the agency. And then the way they, they plan to, to release these ventilators on the field is by allowing them to run under clinical trials. So they will ask the doctors just to say, okay, uh, what, what is your plan to try this device and to increase the size of the trial? So the very first thing, maybe you try with one, two patients, then five, then 10, then you kind of scale this kind of trial, maybe to another centers. But uh, in, in all the cases, this needs to pass the okay of the ethical committee of the hospital because uh, one of the, even in the conversation, there were some really hard moments like, okay, I have, the, I have a good respirator and I have your custom made respirator. Should I just disconnect someone from the, from the professional respirator to try with yours? In which cases can this be used? What are the legal or the legal requirements for us to do this? Uh, yeah, this is kind of the, the the requirements, the trials are just 
well, just like write the document so the doctor know how to use the machine or teach them how to use the machine, uh, specify what are your trials. And also one of the things that maybe caused was the least suspected one was kind of electromagnetic trials in terms of make sure that your device is not going to interact with any other device on the intensive care unit. But the, the agency has offered like, okay, if you bring the prototype, I will just do this for you in one of our labs. So, so far, I think they are quite open to this idea of uh, having these ventilators under the clinical trial and just uh, have this team like, or support these teams. Uh, but yeah, there are like some minimums. And so far, I think this is the situation in Spain. I think this could open the, the floor to this conversation to see if this is overly complicated or if there should be like better alternatives or if the, to see if this is like uh, enough for, for this kind of trial. So I'm going to answer my screen. Okay, uh, so we go back. Um, you know, think of destiny. Most people in the conversation is actually from Spain. <laughs> Uh, except for maybe Marcos, um, uh, but I think we should just uh, keep going um, anyway. I mean, we we all know how the situation is for for Sp the Spanish situation, where there's been this huge amount. This is what I was talking about. There's been this huge amount of uh, of uh, ventilators being produced by a lot of people. I would be great, but we're streaming live in. Uh, <laughs> We're streaming live in English, so I think we should stick to English, even though we should not be exclusive on this. It's it's been kind of hard to to keep people. The Americans wanted to go to talk technology instead. Uh, I guess it's a cultural thing to talk about uh, talk about the legal aspects because I have to say also it really feels that we are the very advanced level at this point uh, in Europe in general. There is a high level conversation with the Commission about uh, how to accelerate this kind of innovation that comes from the grassroots and it's uh, being used in a field where until now was, we were not really allowed to innovate uh, because it was pretty complicated for, for a one-man show to go in. And we've seen amazing collaborations between med medical uh, professionals and engineers at this point. But I would like uh, everybody to just, I mean, everybody in now was in the previous session except for uh, Jose Gomez and, uh, and Miguel Angel that comes from the other panel. So if you would like to just introduce yourselves briefly so we can uh, uh, open the floor to discuss afterwards. So Jose or Miguel Angel, who wants to be first? Jose first? Okay. Oh, Miguel Angel first. <laughs> yeah. Okay with me. Please. Okay, so I introduce myself. I'm Miguel Angel. I'm, I'm working at the University of Barcelona and I'm coordinating the effort in pro coronavirus makers in Spain uh, for uh, producing a mask that is basically uh, great for uh, created for um, for an ER room. So basically, in the in the most hostile environment, that, that the steel uh, is is, uh, is basically providing a, a P3 uh, or even better uh, isolation and filtering. And so, which are the challenges that you're facing from the homologation and legal aspects? Yeah, basically from the homologation aspect is uh, in. in I'm, I'm not being all the all in, in all the conversation about the respirator, but uh, basically there you have at least a compassive uh, way, you know. So basically, in at some point, if if there is um, a, a decision that you need to do, either you use this machine or either you don't and you die, then you, you would probably do it. This is not the case with a with a mask because you don't see the effects in the moment. Uh, but uh, indeed, this is very important that we are developing uh, something in this in, in this direction because you don't see the the, the, the effects in the moment but uh, all the all the emergency uh, staff will basically get more and more uh, ill and will they won't be able to to assist other people so this is very important that we address it and uh, the, the problem is that since it is not so visible in that in that in that sense it's not like a um, life or death matter they, they don't uh, easy the, the homologation process for, for them. Um, 
so basically I know that in Spain there are many, many companies that they are already ongoing on these homologations, but uh, they are really, really uh, lengthy and really difficult to, to pass. Um, and we are basically trying to 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 to, uh, to uh, raise awareness that we need also to easy the the process. Of course, not about the tests themselves. We need them. We need to to give the ER uh, room uh, staff something that is filtering indeed. Uh, but at least the bureaucratic steps could be. We, we don't need an homologation. We don't we don't want to commercialize anything at this point. What we want to do is basically to. To, to give them something. So if you don't want to call it homologation, call it validation, and then you easy some of some of the steps, keeping all the all the all the tests in the laboratory for, for the safety. And and that's that's the, the way that we are trying to go trying to go right now. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And then uh, Jose, would you like to introduce yourself? Yep. Yeah. Hi, Jose Gomez Marquez. Um uh I uh, uh, work at MIT. I have run a lab called Little Devices, and what we do is mash up a maker and health technology. We've been doing that for about 10 years. And then we also have a group called Maker Health, which was one of the first groups that um, in, in America was the first. We, we put maker spaces, medical maker spaces, inside the hospital so that the hospital creates its own, its own devices uh, on an on demand basis. Um, I've been paying attention. Uh, and I have to say, it's kind of funny that, uh, well, Caesar is responsible for bringing me in. It's kind of funny that I think it's probably, what, three or four years ago that uh, David was in a, in, a, in a talk that I randomly gave in Bilbao. And, I, and, and I, I said some controversial things about black boxes. And who knew that, you know, four years later, we'd be having this conversation uh, in, a, in a real impactful way. Um, we've been paying, so, so we may have been paying a lot of attention and I, I want to pick up on what uh, Miguel Angel says. Um, to just cut to the chase, we are making stuff in the hospitals, we are giving them to patients, it's, it's actually helping patients. Um, I don't think we need homologation either. And this is very controversial, but I think that basically the moment that we took um, the, the, you know, the devices and then started to work with helpful companies, uh, this is what I've been observing and then what we've seen here, that immediately grinds to a halt um, that says, well, we can help you scale this solution. Well, now you have a lot of liability actors, all, all interconnected. And it, it has, it, and it does slow things down, um, even though the, their, their ability to manufacture and scale is, is tremendous. But I, I don't think the traditional systems that we have are really prepared for this. They're changing rapidly. But I think at the end of the day, even with a simple, uh, on Monday, I think many of you, Cesar was helpful in printing it. You know, we made an X, it's an X, something that it's like, you know, and everybody thought that we were Richard Feynman. I said, no, this is an X, you know, it just does this. And it became like, it was on the news in Madrid. And it's because um, they're just not predicted. What, what, what we have shown that works and what we're doing, um, and I'll stop there, is the more traditional, more, you know, arts and crafts, no, it doesn't scale to a million, but I think we can get a million to make them. Basically enabling the doctors and the nurses in, this, in the systems within the hospital to generate these devices. And then they fall under the practice of medicine. And then there is studies within the hospital of how to, how to essentially roll them out to the unit, even though it's within each institution. Um, because we know that the moment you launch it out, yes, you can do it under the guise of a, under, under the ages, not the guise, the ages of a, of, a, of a clinical trial. I think that's really smart, um, but it immediately stops uh, adoption. And I think that the other thing that's gonna happen is we'll see a very spectrum of adoptions, right? Every, you know, you're, you're, America's gonna be the hardest because we have a very high liability. Um, culture of, of, of suing everybody. I think uh, Spain is right now being the example to the world. And I'm really eager to see what's gonna happen in, um, in Central and South America. I think that was a great opening for the conversation. So basically, as to set the ground, uh, we're looking at uh, the, the moral discussion on whether we should be using a device because we are in a life-threatening situation. <clears throat> And we know the device can also harm the person, but using it 
might be better than not using it. And, and I think this is, this is actually happening at every level. And that's why I, uh, I asked um, uh, Miguel Angel to join. Uh, unless he wants to, to speak as well, I will just give you the, the word in a second because he's not working with the ventilator. I mean, the ventilator is super clear, right? You're putting a, a pipe into somebody's throat, you're pumping air into this person's lungs, and uh, there is a strong potential of harming somebody if you pump air too quick. Uh, but Miguel Angel is looking at the opposite. It's like it's a, it's a medical professional going into the emergency room or internal care unit, and it's a highly toxic environment. And in its protection gear, uh, and the conflict we have right now in many countries in Europe is that there is not enough protection gear. So the makers are making the protection gear, people are using it. And in Spain, actually, we have had a strong conflict because some regions have been approving the uh, 3D printed uh, protection gear, while some others have been saying this is not safe. And people keep on asking for it because they, it's better having this than having nothing, right? So this, this is really the kind of conflict we're here to discuss. But Ignacio, you wanted to say something? Please open the microphone and uh, introduce your pitch. Yes. Well, having, having uh, here uh, Jose, I, I fully agree with him uh, that uh, now the problem is more than homologation, is a problem of uh, people that are dying. So, uh, and we focus initially because, of course, uh, I, I have been uh, logically seeing all the developments from MIT. I was in 2007 there. And uh, in the first step, of course, we focus in the idea to develop something mechanical. Well, all the all the gears around this kind of uh, ventilator, respirator. But we realize that the problem is is not making something that it is mechanically uh, or or something. The problem is not mechanical. The problem is that if you know or, or now has one people that could operate the ambu. Okay, that is that is fair. Okay? You have one people that operate the ambu. It looks that the patient is now breathing normally, so he can now stop, or he can uh, uh, logically make the the breathing more more uh, press uh, because the people is in not a very good situation. So, at the end, the problem is how to make the ambu work like a people works with the ambu. And this was now the approach to use artificial intelligence, eh, so machine learning, eh, to make kind of uh, approach like a people use the AMBU. Not approaching how eh, to make the AMBU works. Make the AMBU works. I use now this kind of approach of uh, the tensiometer, but uh, you can now think in one bag with another bag surrounding the first one and using the, the outside bag, uh, pushing air inside, and then you can press the, the, the inside uh, bag with uh, a, a kind of pressure. So the idea is more than, than uh, develop one mechanical device, is develop a procedure uh, that can now work like a people. And uh, of course, if you have now MATLAB, reinforcement learning, all of these tools that normally I am using to develop uh, big uh, and complicated machinery uh, for learning uh, plants or industrial plants. So transposing that uh, to the ambience that you can now put this in kind of Arduino, this uh, model that you have uh, the 2860, and then using this Arduino to feed up uh, the, the AMBU, well, this is now approved by the, we can say the authorities, because at the end, AMBUs are approved. And the idea is to use AMBUs as, as a people will use or will now uh, make this AMBU works. Okay. <laughs> I have a, a question just for the for the, or, or the, all the teams, and I think there is this this challenge right now. We were having this conversation at least uh, in terms of respirators, 
And I agree with Jose that that liability is one of the big questions, like what what who is liable? And I'm also wondering with right now, all these devices are quite complex. If you get a motor and the motor burns, it's quite clear maybe that the manufacturer give you a bad motor or you are using that in an unintentional way. But I'm wondering about, uh, given that we are talking about like legal and certification, I'm just wondering about the software part, because for example, one of the things and, and challenges that was exposed in this meeting in the morning was like, okay, we are thinking that uh, we have some features in the in the ventilator, but we can send you like maybe in one week time as uh, an upgrade and you can just change the software and it's going to be, so we are facing this, this more fluid times where the software can be like really changed in a really fast way. Like you were saying with reinforced learning, you can create these kind of loops uh, and start like uh, uh, improving the software, like not in a two years time, but in a weekly time. But what happens then with all the trials? Because one of the things that we got of the, uh, out of the meeting is you test a machine with a software and then you keep the software like they're frozen forever because you tested the machine with a proper, we are all time now thinking about software defined behaviors. It's like Tesla just changes the, you upgrade the software, it, it improves the auto driving capabilities. But what happens with this kind of medical machines, at least we, I think it could be interesting to know your opinion right now, when we are thinking about like improving really fast versus keeping it really safe. I don't know if this is a false dichotomy. And I also think Miguel Angel wants to talk. I don't know if this is related. So we can have several topics on. Just one, uh, one consideration I would like to do, uh, Cesar. Nice yeah. to meet you, Cesar. I like your beard and I'm becoming bald as you. So uh, we think, uh, I don't know uh, uh, how much clinical engineering all you guys have knowledge about, but in the 1970s, uh, Air Force pilot developed the Mark 7 that was a completely mechanical ventilator. Uh, it's not r well suited for the coronavirus. It's more suited for other kinds of conditions. But if we manage to solve like 90% of the patients that need ventilation on a mechanical machine, like the one that I'm trying to build, uh, the software becomes a problem for the 10%, right? So I think one of the objectives that we have to, to try to maintain is um, kind of, uh, I cannot start my video again, sorry. Uh, it's try to be objective on solving the bigger problem as fast as possible. So uh, as soon as we, as we solve this for the major of the people, we can try to think about the others because the same problem that we solve for the 90% will be uh, like pre-solved when we embed the electronics on the machine. Uh, I understand your concern, Cesar, but uh, we have to like keep tight on the numbers because the numbers don't lie. Uh, the cases, the scenarios, and the ages of the people. So, of course, uh, old people is dying, but here in Brazil, 50% of the critical cases are on people between 18 and 40 years because it's a very um, people live on very tiny houses and they have a lot of humidity. So uh, in these cases, I think that uh, the software has to work side by side. That's why we, we did like the Spartan and the Mark II version. We are work, work, working together. So once we release the Spartan, the Mark II has already all the hardware and mechanical needed to embed more technology on a reliable system that has overpressure control, PIP valve control, uh, breathing inhalatory speeds and everything. Uh, in Nacio, I read a paper last, uh, like yesterday, or, because a lot of people is saying that we should uh, increase the ventilation frequency to uh, something like 200 BPM. I don't know if you heard about it. I don't know if you have clinical knowledge about that. 
uh, but I'm not sure that uh, reliable uh, thing. But I, I, I thought you had some medical background. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Well, the idea is that uh, if you look to the solution uh, that uh, is implemented in this kind of reinforcement learning, a lot of the machines that has been implemented till now and has been uh, tested here in Spain, there is a, a very easy problem. Uh, you have now the machine running uh, and then the, the patient starts to cough. The machine yes. continues running. And yes. then the patient is at the same time having the breath in from the machine and the cough. So it's classically a very big problem. So yes, we, we solved that with valves. We had a diverting valve. We have four inlets. And when the pressure is positive on the patient side, it closes all the valves and send it to the expiratory valve. Um, uh, so this is a, a design of Ethan Moses. He has a YouTube channel. He heard about our project and joined forces with us. But I would like to ask, uh, first of all, uh, well, first Miguel has, uh, the, he was raising his hand, has something to say. Uh, but at some point, I would also like to hear about, I mean, besides which is your political stand, uh, Marcos, regarding your view on, okay, we have to do this yes or yes, because there is no options. These are the numbers. I also would like to hear which are the regulatory bodies in, in Brazil, right? That will be very interesting to know uh, okay. to, to, to get like the, the, official, the official line, because I also know, for example, that people from Resistencia, they are considering exporting their project to other, to other places and, uh, and they're trying to, to try to follow the same kind of level of uh, safety and regulations that they try to do in Spain. So they want to advise people at other places so they can also you know, make the trials. Uh, so what, what's the legal aspect there? In Brazil? Yeah. So uh, Brazil is a third world country. We are pretty shitty like on health. Uh, the company of uh, that I work, we fix hospital equipment, uh, everything on hospitals because normally hospitals have 15, 20 year old equipment. So I have a, a little bit of background on that. Uh, the regulatory agency here, like two weeks ago, released a notice saying, look, guys, uh, China is not exporting to us. The United States is buying everything they have. Uh, we don't have like a very strong uh, like manufacturing plants here that can produce uh, like uh, on the on the um, on the rate that we need to rate. So. We are removing all the, so you can now in Brazil for 180 days, you can import any medical equipment and any uh, medicine, even if it's not regulated, even if, it, if it's for testing purposes, because uh, on the point of view of the Brazilian government, as I can see on this paper, they assume that, okay, we cannot solve, if we keep the bureaucracy, we are gonna, kill more people than if we uh, doesn't have the, like the, these rules so fast. And so um, they released a paper saying, look, we have to solve this like for yesterday. The, we have the infections coming up this week and, um, and I can send you the, the notice. It's even on our GitHub page. Yeah, please. Yes. Uh, based on the chat, people are very interested in the conversation. Actually, a couple of questions came up and we'll bring them up before we continue with Miguel and Jose. Uh, uh, Bernham is the nickname. Said, uh, my background is medical device engineering. I have successfully submitted software systems for, uh, to FDA. On the question of software verification in updates, the 62,304 standard is clear about identifying software risk and verification that needs to happen. In the US, as long as the software updates uh, does not increase or add new risk, it can be updated without regulatory concern, but still needs to be verified at software level and at least a subset of affected systems testing each update. So this is something that we brought up in Spain as well because uh, during the meeting we had last Monday with regulatory bodies, people asked and uh, they said, no, when you submit a machine, the machine is closed. There's like no chance you can be updating software. You know, uh, that then you need to repeat the whole testing again. And there is another note from uh, Khaled and it says, our problem in the US is that without some kind of approval or certification, 
the medical professionals will just not use devices. And this is fair. Is there any knowledge or understanding of whether the uh, EAU process that, uh, that the FDA has introduced is a viable way to get a ventilator design approved quickly? And how quickly is quickly expected to be? So this is kind of in line with what happens in Spain again, where uh, it's the same thing as in Brazil. They remove regulation, uh, the normal regulation, and they said we create this like speed up line, but it will never be hom homologated. So it will only be considered a medical trial, which means exactly. uh, after, after the emergency expires, your device is not valid no more. Exactly. Uh, yeah, Wait, I think next one uh, was Miguel. Yeah, thank you. Uh, sorry, because this is evolving and evolving, but my, my question is from, from before, uh, from Jose Gomez. Uh, so basically, I, I, I think that for some equipment, for some safety gear, like for example, the face shield, uh, I agree totally with the, with the fact that we should leave in the hands of the, of the physicians if they see it right or not to use it, no? Uh, it, it's good that we, we make an effort to, to make it really strong and really reliable, but in the end, uh, all, the, all the regulations and all the validations and all the homologations on that, uh, it's, it's a little bit over, overkill. But on the, for, for example, on, on, the, on what I'm working with, the, the, the masks for ER room staff, where basically if you don't give the 100%, then you are basically uh, making sure that all of them are going to get at some point ill. Uh, you need to pass some, at least the, the basic steps. Uh, you, you need to, to provide all these tests in, in the laboratory. And what I say is that uh, we should have only those and we should really go like direct to the point in, in, in that sense. Uh, I wouldn't leave on the hands of the physician to, to, to decide on, on the GR itself, at least um, referring to the, to the masks. Uh, I would really do the tests all the way um, and yeah that's it so jose yes you have okay the floor. just i feel we're in fifth grade but this is working um uh absolutely i no i agree i'm not saying that you know you can ask cesar when he first invited me to the whatsapp and everything was like we're all going to make a ventilator i told i told cesar you know, you're going to not like me anymore because I think it's crazy for that, for, for, because I think these things matter, right? And I think we've seen a lot of crap out there too, which is, which is the scary part. Okay, so regarding masks, um, I just put a, a link in, in Cedar Rapids, it's a hospital that, one of the hospitals that we work with, they made a mask, but more importantly, we also consulted and created a protocol to validate the mask within the hospital. And so I called a bunch of people, you know, everything from like, we know the virus is like 0.3 microns. Do we have to filter the, mic the, the virus? No, because the virus doesn't live on its own. It lives in, in mucus and the mucus is three microns. So that sort of stuff. We had a lot of conversations about that and really created a protocol of how to validate it. And what's interesting that I'm hearing from this conversation is that this wonderful community defeated the black box, but now the new black box is how do we how do we navigate this regulatory and validation step? Uh, I think in Spain, they're being a lot more transparent. I think in Brazil, it's very Brazilian of you, which is amazing. Um, in America, it is still a black box. Yes, there's a website in the FDA, but it just says, I mean, if you go to it, it just, it's, it's really up in the air. You really have no idea, like, do I need five pigs? Do I need 10 pigs? Um, that sort of stuff. Um, the, the, the other thing that I wanted to just point out, so, so we believe in validation. I just think that there's a, there, there's a subtle difference in, 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 in how do you democratize that validation. The other thing that I wanted to, to jump on, because I don't think we answered Cesar's original concern about software and how that gets updated and stuff like that. I think that there's a, uh, there's a very good case study in the Project Night Scout, and I'm not going to go on too long about it because you guys can Google it. But Project Night Scout basically created a software mechanism to monitor um, type one diabetes glucose users, which are really difficult and very risky, okay? And they just did it. Just like you, like, just like everybody here is essentially making a device. 
Um, they weren't selling it. It literally had a Facebook group and they took it to the FDA to basically do largely what we're trying to do is saying, okay, what do we do now? And to this day, the FDA said, well, who is the officer of the company? And, and, and the people in charge were like, no, we have a Facebook, a Facebook group. But, you know, um, and to this day, the FDA can't do anything about it because they cannot regulate something that is not sold. That is true. That is if for the same reason that you see in the senior citizen homes in Spain and here in Boston, a bunch of walkers with sliced tennis balls. Nobody regulates that crap. Okay, it is you because it's a it. And what we call that is a hardware protocol. It's the same reason that neither the FDA in America or the I don't know what it's called in Spain. Uh, I should because we're working there now. Um, when you make a cast, okay, when you get when 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 when, when you were a little kid and, and you broke your arm. They don't regulate the plaster, it's plaster. And they don't, it because you make the cast. So I think that's why you see my bias against mass manufacturing, because if we stay by democratizing these things, then we can still fly under the radar and still be ethical, obviously, um, about these things. Um, but, but I think that I, I put the GitHub because now that project has more than, I think almost, well, 5,000 commits but more importantly, I think it has more than 4,000 users around the globe. Um, and it's an example of what happens when you truly democratize these processes. And, and we're, we are gonna make some people upset. And you know what? Some biomedical engineers are tearing their hair out right now. Some clinical engineers are tearing their hair out right now because they recognize that they studied seven years biomedical engineering. And I'm, I'm not working on ventilators, but you are. And, um, and everybody just did it in two weeks. So. It is a moment that people are not accustomed to. I think we just need to pay attention to how do we, how, again, how do we, how do we validate within the clinic and, and then just multiply those clinics? Stop right there, David. I, I just for, for, for completion, for, for completing the, the information here, uh, I, I, I had a chat today with, uh, with one of the heads in, the, in Andalusia. And basically uh, that's, that, that basically will, um, uh, sorry, to summarize why I'm going so, so hard in, in having all the tests and not only the clinical tests, but also in the laboratory, like really testing the filtration uh, that you are doing. And, and this is the, the following. Uh, so far, it's true. It's, it's basically not even not even in the, in the medical um, society, uh, there is a true um, agreement on, on how is, uh, or what is the, the route that you are getting more ill. And, and the problem is uh, that in, for, for normal use, like for a policeman or for, a, for any, any, any people that is out, uh, usually everything, every, every piece of the gear, like the one that I just checked that you are doing in the, in, in the, 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 the face mask no? that, that you, are, you had in the YouTube uh, link, that's, that's already enough. But the problem is, and he was telling me, like, Miguel, do you think that the, the viruses are uh, still um, in suspension and, and of course from a physicist point of view i'm physicist from a physicist point of view they are and they are living there for some hours and they, they there is a there's a well, let, let me finish and, and i will try to so in the in, in the end is that if you are in an ear room uh, you will get more and more of this so if you are putting more and more of this uh, all the time so there is a moment in which also you need to consider the the viruses in suspension so in that specific so hostile uh, room, and it's kind of like you, you should really think about it, like you are really in front like two centimeters of a very ill person. And in that specific uh, scenario, you really need to, to, to go uh, to the lab and to test all the gear. What I say is again, bureaucracy out, only tests. Um, but, just to say, uh, when, when I was telling him that I did the maps and, and, and you can see that really the virus stays there and can be inactivated really quick and so, but you are in putting more and more from new, from the, from the patients. Um, and, and then he told me like, you know what, that makes sense because we are implementing a very harsh uh, cleaning procedure on all the, all the health workers and still we got 10,000 of them ill in, 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 in the house. And that only can be explained with this. So I'm, I'm, I don't know, maybe I'm overkilling it, uh, but I think that we should, at least for the, uh, for, for the masks for the year room, we should really 
do all the tests and not only to give it to the to, to the clinical tests. I think this goes to the yeah yeah. Okay. No, no. Do you want Jose to go ahead? I, I was going to, to add some part to that, but I think it's uh, one of the things we we just discovered the just by checking how this is evolving. One of the most uh, mediatic projects so far has been this kind of mask with Decathlon or other brands. These are snorkel masks where you get like the snorkel mask with some kind of intakes, uh, outtakes for the air. And one of the challenges we, we found is that initially this piece was released to for patients, for patients that were laying there that needed some extra oxygen. And the 3D printed piece allowed it to connect just to the flow of air coming to the room and to the filtration system. But one of the things we discovered uh, the other day in a call is when we are thinking about solutions and, and scenarios, we have to think about who is the final user, what, where, what is the environment that this is going to be used for. Because one of the things we have discovered is that, for example, now some, some doctors are using the Decathlon mask, using some HMA like uh, filters right there in the intake and the outtake. And we got the, we were in the group with some specialists in, the, in uh, additive manufacturing and lab trials to verify how things uh, really work. And, and he said, we have been doing trials in the lab and from a scale from zero to 100, the, the snorkel mask gets a rating of five out, out of 100 for the face shield. So even if the, the, the face mask looks like super sturdy and feels like this, it could take everything out of the ambient for you, it's like you will get the virus from the shields. And even if you think about it, the given that you are going to be snorkeling, you cannot put safety glasses there or you cannot wear any mask comfortably inside. So by not specifying where or who can use what solution where, we are creating maybe some chances for people to get uh, infected. So uh, I, I go to the, to the point of, of Miguel Angel, like, it's really critical just to just to share the information, not just about the device, but who is the final user, who can benefit from this, and who who not. Because with ventilators, it's the same. We have seen so many ambus and so many, but with the ambus, so far the doctors I've been talking to, they say, okay, you cannot keep more than twenty-four hours someone with an ambu. So even if we think, okay, this device can help someone. Yeah, maybe for six, eight, ten hours, but not for two weeks. And and again, I think this is all we are like creating something that wasn't there before. That is some kind of layer approach. We, because we, if you have like high class ventilators, everyone gets a high class ventilator. But when there is a shortage, we still need to think what are the cases or what are the scenarios where this particular device can be helpful. And this is part of the conversation, like setting up who is the final users, who benefits from that, and out of all the possible uses for the device, where these have been tested, actually. So I think you wanted to talk, uh, yeah. Yeah, just briefly, um, I, I absolutely, I think that um, the, for, regarding masks, um, absolutely, I think we have to do the test. We have to do. You know, at the beginning, we 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 consulted with some folks at the Harvard School of Public Health that do bio, bioaerosols, and so that's where we got our guidance. And the, the, what we learned, for instance, not to get too technical, because I know this is not the point of the tech. This is not a technical talk. Um, you know, we said that the fit is really important, less the filter. And so we focused on the fit, um, and that's why you saw me get up. We ended up using these guys. Um, so this is what. Um, you know, uh, I don't know, I, we don't use them, but Cesar, if you and I went to like uh, the Oscars, you know, if I wanted to make sure that my, my, my uh, gown didn't, uh, didn't slip, I put it here and it stays in place. So okay. it's double-sided tape. And so that way I can, um, I can put it on my, you know, put over here and then, 
you know, you know, and it's stuck. Okay, so, um, uh, but so so we we did that, and then we challenged, and then our initial question was. Do I need to use, for instance, a ca an Anderson cascade impactor and create like a two chamber thing with barrel cells on one side, attack it with a virus? What's then an easy virus to a cat? Can I, can I use lentivirus or something like that? So we asked those, a lot of those questions. Our, our, our expert folks told us, just do a fit test. If you can do a fit test, we know you're filtering most of it. But I think that we, if, we, if we needed to do the other more biological test, there is absolutely no reason why we can't and we shouldn't. But it is important for the community to understand that when people say you need to do these tests, you know, it's not that hard. Like we can do this. We can, you know, if, 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 if we can grow beer in our basement, we can do these types of tests in a safe manner. And the problem is sharing that knowledge just as much as the way we're sharing the, the 3D printed examples. Um, so I fully concur about, 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 about the importance of, of, of testing. Yeah. I don't know if you are aware, Jose, that one of the things that when, when you, we, we have been talking about black boxes and regulatory stuff, and one of the things that just, well, I, I don't know if I would say surprised me the most, is that after this kind of uh, pandemic started spreading, some of the black boxes have opened, at least in a temporary manner. Like, for example, there were some papers released uh -huh. That were like there is a collection of two thousand papers that just were available for the academics. Now they are open, so everyone can get to find solutions. But also here in in Europe, I don't know if it came just from the European level or the Spanish level. We also got some uh, the the UNA norms to build uh, the equipment for personal protection are open right now. So anyone can get to read the papers on what is tested, what are the trials. And I'm, this is kind of a paradoxical situation because we, we already have some tests and ready some protocols for trial, but you kind of have to pay for that. And it's kind of just for some people that are really specialists. But when there is the real need, then it's open. Like, oh, we have the need and you can consult every kind of legal text. So there is this uh, right now, uh, also I learned uh, today, for example, that uh, under the patent law, at least, uh, I don't know if this is unified, but at least in Spain, article 66 of the patent law specifies that you cannot keep a patent if that attends against public health. So in, in this particular scenario, even the law is providing us tools, like if you're in, in such a need, uh, you can just go ahead and, and use this. So I, I'm just wondering how does it look like for the after uh, coronavirus world? Because so far everyone is like, okay, we need to do things. We need to uh, change the way that things are done. And we are breaking a lot of barriers. So a lot of, I, I know say that we as, as we are, but most institutions, most, bo most bodies that have kept the knowledge under some kind of uh, walled garden or walled uh, um, uh, way are opening that up to solve the changes. And I was thinking, if I'm thinking about the future, that we are thinking about climate change or other kind of long-term scenarios, um, how, how could this current situation affect the availability and access to to the means just to get the knowledge required to change things. And maybe this is kind of a prototype itself of how things can change to provide us the tools and provide us the, the ways to, to break down the boxes and build things in a different way. I, I'm gonna virtually raise my hand for real because I, I, I don't have that tool in the, in the system so I cannot raise the hand. So I have to actually, because I'm the host, I have to interrupt the, the conversation. First, uh, Marcos, uh, he said he needs to leave because he needs to test some valves. So, uh, yes. so I want to thank you, Marcos, for your presence today. That, David, just complimenting what Cesar said. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, just, uh, before I go, uh, okay. so here in Brazil, uh, the government says, if you want to sell a medicine here, you have to show the recipe. So the government explicit says to buyer, for example, uh, okay, you want to get inside, but the government will produce the same medicine that you produce and 
be your rival on the market, right? This is awesome because in Brazil, we have very cheap medicine, for example, for diabetes, and the government gives it for free for everyone. So Caesar, one uh, like a week ago, a journalist called me and on a very philosophical way of thinking, I love philosophy. He told, he asked me, Marcos, isn't the coronavirus the test proof that we needed to the humanity to say that capitalism doesn't work for saving lives and for maintaining a minimal standard of living for everyone? And I said, yeah, because when the a situation like that happened, what a normal liberalism would say is, well, we have a high demand, companies will start manufacturing like on a very high rhythm, and everyone will be happy with a cheap ventilator. And that's not how things work, because normal ventilators use almost handcraft made valves. Uh, the thing I, 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 and I worried about, as you said, about the future of our world after these black boxes are open, uh, and all these people open these black boxes uh, and a lot of manufacturers of ventilators open it, but we cannot build them. That's why they open, because if they could build it, they were profiting right now. So uh, they, they open it because if you find a way to solve the valve equation in the, in the pneumatic system, uh, solve it, you know, it's free for use. It's not, it's not useful for me right now. And, and it's very noble to open on a, this kind of situation. The, about uh, Jose Gomez Marquez, uh, the Argentina guys that are working with me, they solved the problem of the masks for the doctors and the nurses, building a suit made of plastic, like, a, I don't know, like a bag of plastic. And they put positive pressure like a, a aerospace suit. So the air is out, if you punch with a needle or something, the air is always out. And uh, they are prototyping this like in a few weeks. It has a very, very tiny motor on the back. You use some batteries, LiPo batteries, and uh, they keep air flowing in all the time inside the suit, but the air flows through a filter that also the Argentina government kind of the N95 standard from 3M, uh, they are not exporting anymore. So they made, made a latex polymer uh, with some very complex chemistry that I don't understand because I don't have the chemistry base. But this is a latex polymer that can filter like 0 0.3 micro. So it's very good. And the another good stuff is that the polymer has a molecule alignment or something like that, that keeps a very high airflow. It's very uh, interesting. This is public knowledge on the universities of Argentina. Uh, Washington, the guys that working with me can give you the pass off the rocks to this kind of system is scalable, buildable, very easy to do. And, uh, um, and you only take a suit with uh, like a plastic suit and it keeps like pumping air inside. And you have a transparent uh, thing to, to see out. And it's a very, very clever idea. And um, I can put you in contact with them. Sorry, I have to leave. I really, really have to thank everyone. I have to go to the lab testing the valves. And, um, and some meetings with Ethan and all the guys. Thank you very much for the opportunity of you all guys. And I hope that we are united in this situation because it's a global cause and it's not regional. Yeah, thanks Marcos, keep in touch. You know where to find all of us. So I, um, I mean, we're 10 minutes to go to the end. So I really would like to give the opportunity to uh, some other people to talk. I want to remind you that we spoke about a lot of things in the end. Uh, we spoke about the responsibility of programming something with a software that is uh, machine learning based. So how would that behave? We spoke about the black boxes being open because of the circumstances, the legal limitations being put down. And I have to say that uh, the other day talking to the director of the Agency of Innovation in Spain, he was saying we made in 10 days the innovation that it took 10 years to make before. And uh, it's pretty interesting. Ignacio mentioned something on the chat that was pretty good as well. He said that in the States, everything is allowed until they tell you not to do it. In Europe, everything is forbidden until you get the permission to do it. So it's also an interesting, an interesting thing. And I think that's actually pretty much of a capitalist approach to regulation. Um, Marcos brought a very political view as well to the conversation. 
And, uh, but I really would like to, to have a couple of minutes for David to explain us uh, how was their experience on Resistencia with the actual process of testing uh, all, of, uh, all of the legal aspects they faced uh, uh, because everything like the, the legal aspect itself was a black box. So it's not like opening an existing machine was a black box, but the legal aspect was very obscure uh, and they had to like fight all the time trying to get through different places to to get um, just the regulation on what they had to test. So this is the <laughs> this is the complexity of the problem. So David, can, can you say a few words about that? So I am not uh, into in in all the details, but I can tell you uh, that uh, when I entered the this this uh, this this group, this collaboration group, this this team. Uh, they have already. They had already contacted a lot of uh, doctors. Uh, they had a lot of information. They they had um, uh, like uh, a guide of the the things to comply that uh, they need uh, for 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 this approach to 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 have a real good ventilator for critical cases of coronavirus. And also, they have contacted. Uh, uh the the organisms that can give you this uh, approval this kind of uh, emergency certificate but uh yeah we we face uh, a lot of mm, political problems like uh, everyone wants to to have a like a medal like uh, this is be, this has been certified uh, in my area or so and also, we ha we have uh, people making press uh, making us this certification more difficult because they they have uh, uh, economic interests, like they work in the regular industry. That is okay, but uh, for me and not for me only, I, I am a, <laughs> I am a believer in in God. But all the team they 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 see this this is a miracle to have this uh, going through. It's incredible. Anyway, uh, political pressure, like uh, mm, media pressure, is uh, of a lot of help because when people see you have a solution, or or you almost have it, but you have a solution, uh, and you only need the approval, this is a lot of pressure for political uh, class, for the political class. So they are they are going to move. As fast as possible, and make the things as easy as possible, so that they don't, don't, don't they are not uh, blamed for all these people dying. You know what I mean. So uh, we have to use that a little bit in our favor. Favor. We have to, on one hand, do a very good uh, machine because this is for saving people, not for making the problem worse, but uh, we have faced uh, that. that uh, uh, the truth is, we have to use a bit of uh, media pressure to to get it through. And also, the protocols are not not clear. Sometimes we had a protocol, we followed it, uh, and now, please, uh, can you up? Can you add this and this? Uh, well, we can. We can do a more complex machine. We, yes, we can. But uh, you ask. Uh, you ask our team to meet these and these and these uh, uh, goals, and we have already achieved this and more. So uh, this is why we have been passing through several different test te uh, tests with animals. The first one was with a healthy uh, pig, and it was great. The certificator was amazed on of of the achievements. He was expecting a very, very easy machine with not too much uh, controls and sophistication, but but uh, it was not enough. We made that it was not enough. So now we have uh, tested it with uh, the the more difficult conditions you can find in this uh, uh, this illness, and uh, we we are in the latest steps of this uh, certification. So. Uh, what what else can can I do? Uh, can I say um, well? 
Mm, well, I don't know <laughs> if there's any question. Or... I, I am not the, the more, most yeah, expert that, in this area. I think you gave a really good picture of what happened. Uh, so yeah. I, I think this is the other thing, right? It's like, because we're distributed community right now, and this is something that Jose was mentioning earlier, we have distributed responsibility. And right. that is a really powerful tool uh, as well. Like uh, uh, this, uh, also Jorge, Jorge Barrera from Cotec was mentioning this very same thing the other day. It's like, it's really hard to certify a machine by a non-existing entity. <laughs> so yeah, you have a right bunch too. of people that join together because they really wanted to help. They make this thing. And how are they supposed, who's signing papers? Uh, you know, who's legally responsible? Who is going to the ethical committee? Who's paying the bills? And, and um, it's, it's really hard, but we're, we're forgetting that we are actually building society and we should be also having the right to do some of these things. And, and maybe it's time to question uh, some of the existing regulations. Maybe the industrial revolution, the fourth industrial revolution is this. I know what they mm -hmm. told us about 3D printing cats and boxes, <laughs> you know? I think Jose, you wanted to say something? Yeah, no, I just, to, to jump on that point, again, I, I think that this is really uncharted territory. I'm really proud of being Spanish right now because every, I'm really sad that I'm here, honestly. I, if I could catch a plane, I would go there, but then I would die from my wife killing me. Um, <laughs> but, but let's remember, like in the Civil War, right? Doctors in Barcelona it practically invented mobile uh, blood transfusion and, and they just did it. You know, they did it ethically and they did it responsibly. Um, but I think public pressure is going to continue to increase. And um, I, I, I think that that's, I think that that distributed aspect and, and as long as we're being very transparent about these things, it's going to be harder for the bureaucrats to get in the way. Um, and to instead be useful, you know, to, to go down to the granular thing of saying, that I, I was just asking David, like, how many animals do you need to test? What does this look like? Instead of just saying, well, you should know this. No, nobody should know this. We all jumped in on this because we wanted to help because the Medtronics of the world were not solving this, you know? And open sourcing plans, by the way, that nobody understands how to actually make them doesn't really count in my book. Um, and, and I'm not a big open sourcer, but you guys know more about that than I do. So. Um, I think we could take advantage of that. So I'm, I'm excited. And also please use us as a resource. We're on the other side um, and, and we can share as we learn as well. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think I'm gonna take the opportunity to close the meeting right now. If anybody wants to say some final words, uh, this is your chance. Uh, I think Jose I think made we, a great pitch to close, <laughs> by the yeah, way. Yeah, uh, I think we have the chance right now to start like, uh, maybe we will have, now, now each of us are in our homes and now we, I think we have a time to reflect in a way, but also to, to see what worked, what didn't work and to share this knowledge and to keep it like some, something we treasure together. Like, oh, we learned so much in, in three weeks, in one month mm -hmm. that I, I think this is something that we'll keep like for a long time after we go out again to the streets and and it's maybe okay. this is some temporary, but we'll go on. I, I hope that this will not stop here. Uh, it's been it's been an amazing um, it's been an amazing couple of weeks, uh, I have to say. Um, uh, we didn't really mention, but Tasha and I have been involved. You can see we have really been sleeping a lot. We we got engaged very early on in basically distilling information from the Spanish communities and publishing summaries. And very, very quickly, we ended up being among some of the organizers of some of the small aspects within the community, fundraising, logistics, or whatever. Um, at this point, I think we learned uh, really a lot. And I hope I do have a strong belief that we are the, the elephant that comes in the porcelain store and we break a lot of stuff, but in the end, we actually open the door at the end so everybody can go through, you know? So, so we've been that body. And, and um, uh, there's been like these three approaches and I think that were mentioned throughout the talk. The approach number one, it has always been governments have the power to obtain equipment and they buy it somehow. Approach number two is Governments push companies into open sourcing their machinery and they try to copy it. 
but then there's a supply chain problem. Approach number three is we come in, we fix things. It's not that we know better, but we have this ingenuity that will eventually help us find something really good that will help us fix problems that nobody thought about fixing before in that way. So I want to, want to thank you all very much. Uh, this conversation has been recorded, so you can follow it online. This was the Arduino COVID-19 conference. You're all welcome to, um, to uh, follow, uh, check the video online. And if you miss the other two panels, they are all recorded and they will be uploaded to YouTube very soon. So you can watch them as well. Uh, thank you so much, everybody. It was a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for being here today. Thank you, everyone.